Hey there, thank you for tuning into Duck Bricks. I'm Chris and welcome to a brand new series, Bionicle Retold, where I summarize and explain the entire Bionicle storyline across 10 major chapters of the Bionicle story. Spanning 10 years of the entire LEGO theme and thousands upon thousands of years in the Bionicle universe, the Bionicle story was split up into many different mediums. From comics, to books, to movies, to games, there were all sorts of different ways that you could get involved with the Bionicle storyline that were pretty much disparate and scattered across the 10 years of the theme's run. Unlike many modern LEGO themes that are story-based, like Ninjago, there is no central TV show to drive the entire plot. So you can't just go on Netflix and watch the entire Bionicle story, unfortunately. Now just a quick note before we get started, if you do want to get started with the Bionicle storyline, the way that it was told to us, I actually made a video about how to get started with the storyline, where I recommended users check out the Matanui online game, as well as the entire compendium of Bionicle story history, which is a 2000 page document which basically contains all of the books and comics, so you can absorb the story the way that it was meant to be told. If you're a little less patient and maybe don't want to have to read through an entire document, well then this series is for you, because I'll be summarizing and explaining every major key plot point of the entire Bionicle story across 10 chapters and a prologue and an epilogue. Today's prologue will take us into the ancient history of Bionicle. Think of it as, say, the prologue to Lord of the Rings, or the prologue to any lore-based, fantasy-based TV show or movie, where we delve into some expository details about the plot and really get a chance to understand what the setting is of this world. I want to make this very, very clear as well. This contains major spoilers for the entire Bionicle storyline, if that wasn't obvious. You see, the entire Bionicle story hinged on a major cliffhanger, being paid off eight years into the theme. Essentially, all eight years of the theme until the cliffhanger were building the mystery towards this major reveal. And I'm going to be giving away the major reveal right now in this video because it's relevant to the background history of the universe. So again, just your last warning, if you want to consume the Bionicle storyline the way that it was meant to be consumed, by playing the first game that came out and reading the actual books, then I would highly recommend for you to actually do that, I'll refer you to my other video in the description, and you can turn away now. But again, if you just want to hear the story in chronological order to understand what's going on, then this series is for you. But with that, I think now is a great time to just jump right into the prologue of this story, which begins on a planet thousands of light years away known as Spherus Bay. Our story begins on a planet called Spherus Magna, where most of the action in the Bionicle storyline begins and ends. This planet was occupied by three major types of sentient beings. Glatorian, who were physically adept warriors and protectors, Skrull, who were incredibly militaristic warriors and biologically different from Glatorian, and Aguri, who were smaller in stature than either Glatorian or Skrull and made up the vast majority of the population. In LEGO set terms, the Agori were basically your small sets, and the Glatorian or Skrull were the larger sets. These characters had incredibly long lifespans, living for thousands of years unless killed. This was in part due to a refinement they had made to their bodies. Despite being completely organic creatures, they had metallic implants and a completely metallic bone structure. The best way of mentally reconciling this is by thinking of stuff like cyberpunk or humans in the far far future, where mechanical implants and technological upgrades have almost completely overtaken the organic body despite having an organic core. This society of workers and warriors was divided up into eight tribes, based on the regions they lived in and the color of their armor. Fire, water, jungle, ice, rock, sand, iron, and earth. These were generally made up of Glatorian and Agori, except for the Rock Tribe, which was mostly exclusively Skrull. During the early days of the civilization, a Lovecraftian-like being known as Anana roamed free, feeding on the dreams of the Agori. Those she fed on were eventually driven mad and rejected from society en masse. 
At the same time, certain members of the population began to mentally evolve, quickly rising to prominence. Superior in intellect and creativity, these people left behind the confines of tribal society and bestowed upon themselves the totally not egotistical title of great beings, seeing themselves as a vastly superior to the rest. Eventually, these great beings became the scientist kings of the planet, with all other members of society bowing to them. The minds of these great beings became so much more advanced than the other members of the planet that over thousands of years and cycles of evolution, they became biologically different than Agori and Plutorian, almost constituting as a brand new species. The closest analogy that I can come up with here is, say, with humans and monkeys. They both sprung from the same species, but one is much more intelligent than the other. The great beings' minds were just so much more advanced than the standard Agori or Glatorian that they actually counted as a different species as the years passed on. Meanwhile, when Inanna moved to attack the great beings, she was beaten back. Due to the fact that they had biologically evolved past normal Glatorian and Agori, she was unable to truly drive their incredibly complex minds insane and went into hiding after her defeat. With no more major present threats, it was a time of happiness and expansion. During this time of prosperity, the great beings began construction on a colossal prototype robot, which was intended to be piloted by Agori to navigate nearby star systems and explore the known universe, furthering the spread of their civilization. Unfortunately, they were unable to find a stable power source for the robot, and upon attempted launch, it exploded into several pieces across a vast desert. Keep this in mind, because this is basically a Deus Ex Machina that will be relevant for not only just the end of this episode, but the end of the entire Bionicle storyline as a whole. Just remember, the prototype robot exploded due to an unstable power source, and littered all across the desert are the remains of this massive robot. But this happiness was not to last, because after over 50,000 years without her presence, Inanna grew hungry again. At this point, she had faded into legend, and few still passed on the tales of warning about her. Anana chose to specifically target one tribe in particular that were susceptible to her attacks, the Iron Tribe, driving nearly every single one of their members mad over time, eventually killing them all off. To the rest of the Agori, this appeared to be a mysterious and deadly plague that targeted most of the Iron Tribe Agori. From the ones who remained, many were driven mad themselves by the decimation of their entire civilization and all they had known to love, and the only survivors were shunned and driven away from the rest of the Agori in fear of their transmitting the disease. To this day, we only know of two named survivors, who were both filled with hatred and paranoia against the rest of the Agori for this mass shunning. In the grand scheme of things, the decimation of the Iron Tribe and their two remaining members aren't too relevant right now, but just keep them in mind for later because they'll be relatively relevant down the line. Meanwhile, Anana's troublesome misdeeds didn't end there. Grown tired and weary of the militaristic ways of the Skrull, she used her telepathic abilities to expand the mental powers of the female members of the Skrull species, hoping they would use their newfound telepathic powers to wipe out their male counterparts. However, this didn't happen instantaneously, and while it did cause the male and female members of the species to have a major cultural divide, no major conflicts happened until much, much later in the main story. All you need to know at this point is that the female members of the Skrull separated off into their own cult-like society, called the Sisters of the Skrull, isolating themselves completely from the rest of the villages. As years passed, the eight tribes slowly dwindled to just seven main tribes ruling the lands. Of course, you already know what happened to the Sand Tribe, and so there really only were just a few left. Fire, water, jungle, ice, sand, rock, and earth. During this time, the great beings had also grown tired of actively ruling the land, and instead decided to take a step back from the politics of ruling to focus on their scientific experiments and technological expansion. Out of the seven remaining tribes, a single warrior was chosen by the great beings to be imbued with elemental powers via a mysterious scientific process the great beings personally designed. These warriors, now known as the Element Lords, were assigned as the rulers of their individual tribes to act as representatives of each for diplomacy and trade. As the Element Lords ruled Spherus Magna and all its inhabitants, the great beings began to fade more and more into obscurity and legend. They spent this time experimenting on the native animals and even Glatorian Anagori, 
transforming the Sand Tribe into mindless beasts as a game to see who would survive best in the wild, and imbuing the massive insectoid creatures that roamed the land, called Scopios, with biomechanical implants essentially for fun, making the desert a whole lot more dangerous, and giving us LEGO fans a killer set at the same time. It was around this time where everything began to go wrong. As the Agori delved deeper and deeper into the core of Spherus Magna, they uncovered a substance now known as Energized Protodermis. This discovery spurred on the central conflict of the Bionicle story. When Energized Protodermis was discovered by the Ice Tribe, the first Agori to touch the substance with his bare hands was instantly vaporized. And that was just the tip of the iceberg. When animals and other objects were exposed to the substance, they not only were just disintegrated, some actually were mutated and transformed into fantastical new creatures. Immediately seeing the limitless potential for such a powerful substance, the Element Lord of Earth advised the Lord of Ice to barricade his territory, refusing to share it all except of course with the Earth Tribe, and ordering all Glatorian of Ice to defend the land at all cost. This understandably angered the rest of the Element Lords, who naturally assumed the Lord of Ice would share it with the rest of them, at least via trade. As diplomacy broke down and the ice territory was transformed into a full-on kingdom overnight, the core war began and the beginning of the end was nigh. The mining of energized protodermis, which came from the core of the planet, caused the planet to grow unstable, with the protodermis bubbling up onto the surface of the planet all across the globe, only further fueling major conflict over these hotspots. The Agori and Glatorian began to attempt to study the energized protodermis, turning it into weapons and major forces of destruction. Absolutely horrified by the state of society, the great beings attempted to step in, but since so much time had passed since their dominance, their calls for peace were largely ignored, with almost every single tribe succumbing to the war. Taking advantage of technology developed by the great beings, the Agori began to even modify animals for war, fusing organic creatures with mechanical implants to hone them for battle. As the battles raged, this proved to be one of the bloodiest conflicts in the entire history of the Bionicle story. The power of the Lord of Jungle caused hundreds of warriors to be fused into trees and plant life, creating an eerie forest of blades and corpses. Even warriors who had grown disillusioned of fighting were soon pulled into the conflict, with very few remaining safe havens left on the entire planet that hadn't been touched by the conflict. Even innocent Agori who were non-combative were inadvertently killed in the senseless fighting over this resource. During this conflict, the great beings began to secretly recruit Agori to serve them in the name of peace. Some of these Agori were tasked to gather samples of energized protodermis and send them back to the great beings. Upon an intensive analysis of the substance, the great beings realized that the sheer amount of energized protodermis being drawn from the core was destabilizing the planet, and society as a whole was on the path towards an extinction level event if energized protodermis continued to be drawn from the planet. To address this, the great beings developed two major contingency plans. The first was a short term solution. To end the war, the great beings developed completely mechanical shape-shifting killers called Batera, created for one singular purpose, to wipe out any being ever seen holding a weapon. Unleashed en masse, these Batera proved to significantly slow the war, but at an incredible cost to the population. Unfortunately, due to their incredibly advanced AI, even after the great beings attempted to shut them down because they were dealing more harm than good, the Batera rejected their programming, instead revolting against the great beings and rampaging across the land, wiping out anyone they could find who was wielding a weapon. And so they developed this second plan, which was more of a long-term solution. Unsure of the long-term viability of the planet, the great beings drafted this much more extreme plan. Remember that prototype robot designed to map out star systems and expand civilization that was ultimately abandoned because they couldn't figure out a good, stable power source? Well, the great beings decided to resurrect the project, fueling a new, second version of the robot with energized protodermis, which was the only substance powerful enough to keep it afloat and stable. The goal of this new project, dubbed the Great Spirit Robot to signify the fact that it carried the spirit of Spherus Magna, was to survey other worlds, learn more about other cultures and planets, and after a hundred thousand years, return to Spherus Magna with hopefully the tools and knowledge gained necessary to repair the planet at its core. This robot was colossal in scale. 
It stood at 40 million feet high and contained its own internal gravity and weather systems that could be independently controlled. The most interesting part of this robot, however, was that it essentially was an entire universe. To populate this world and run the internal mechanics of the robot, the great beings made an entirely new, biomechanical species known as Matoran. These were not fully organic, like the Glutorian and Agori, but they also weren't fully robotic, like the Batera. They were essentially the perfect blend in between, and most similar to some of the most advanced great beings and the advanced Glutorian who had become more machine than man. These were similar in scale to Agori, but their minds were completely artificial, at least at the start. In the beginning, they were little more than robots, with some organic components, operating entirely based on their programming directives to fulfill certain tasks, like maintaining the power source, executing repairs, and so on. During construction of this robot, the great beings use advanced science and biological experiments to create a being known as Tren Krom to oversee construction and govern the Matoran as the great spirit was being built. Tren Krom was completely organic, featuring no mechanical parts whatsoever and had immense telepathic abilities to be able to govern the minds of all Matoran in his vicinity and keep the workers on task. Oh, and one last thing I didn't mention. Tren Krom is horrendous in appearance. He's essentially a blob of pinkish flesh with tentacles and barbed hooks sticking out of every end of him. He has just two eyes inset into a gelatinous skull, but had the ability to grow extra eyes anywhere around his body so he could be all-seeing, and he could also shoot frickin' laser beams from his eyes. This isn't really that relevant right now, but I'm just trying to paint a picture here so when Shren Krom appears later on in the story, you'll maybe be able to better understand why some characters literally go mad just by seeing him. He's that horrendous. But anyways, after construction of the Great Spirit Robot was done, Tren Krom's usefulness was over, and the Great Beings placed him far away from the proceedings at the center of the robot, confining him to an island of his own where we wouldn't see him in the story until much, much later. Meanwhile, as construction of this robot was occurring, the Core War raged on. At this point, some tribes had formed uneasy alliances with each other, and the Earth tribe had been essentially shunned and systematically killed off for being the people who started this war by manipulating the Lord of Ice to take the Protodermis for himself and them. In a pivotal battle that ended the war, a legion of Skrull, fresh from a major victory over the Jungle Tribe, routed the Ice Tribe from their mountains, giving the Fire Tribe a chance to break through the Northern Ice Tribe flank and finally seize control of the original spring of Energized Protodermis, which caused all this fighting to begin with. Unfortunately, the Fire Tribe then proceeded to foolishly drain the wellspring of all its energized protodermis, significantly advancing the planet's decay and causing earthquakes to break out all over the planet. The Great Beings, observing this destruction, hastily began preparations to launch the Great Spirit Robot. It's at this point in the story that I want to address one major thing. Despite what the legends may say, the Great Beings were far from benevolent gods. Sure, they all did want what was best for society, but many of them had massive egos and saw themselves as literal gods because of their physically advanced and mentally advanced nature above the rest of the population. This was not a great mix for a brand new universe being created, and we're gonna get into why right now. And so, in all this chaos, one rogue great being named Velika made a choice that would kickstart the entire Bionicle story and launch the main conflict that would drive 10 years worth of the LEGO theme. In the final moments before launch, Veliga essentially pushed a software update to all Matoran, which elevated them beyond mindless robots assigned to do certain tasks and imbued them with a form of artificial intelligence that he had been secretly developing, which was so advanced they became no different than the average Agori or Glatorian back on Spherus Magna. He did this not out of the goodness of his heart, but with a plan to later reveal himself as the source of their free will, in hopes they would choose to worship him because of this. Because what really is the point of having a mindless army of robots worship you, when you could give them sentience and have them choose to worship you out of their own free will? Now that's what Velika's talking about. It was this sentiment that caused every single inhabitant of the Matoran universe to gain full sentience and consciousness all at once. While most still went about their daily tasks, as time went on, they became more and more independent, functioning as unique individuals with personalities, hopes, fears, and dreams. Velika had, whether intentionally or not, just created a new sentient species. 
And as this great spirit robot blasted off into deep space, carrying a brand new fully intelligent species on board, the Korwar ripped the planet apart in a major event known as the Shattering. From this destruction, three new celestial bodies were born. Bota Magna, home to vast jungles and biomechanical animals and dinosaurs. Bera Magna, now a vast post-apocalyptic desert littered with the ruins of the previous society, housing the vast majority of the surviving Agori and Glatorian. And Aqua Magna, an ocean-filled planet with no surviving Agori or Glatorian inhabitants. The stage was now set for an epic journey as the inhabitants of the Great Spirit Robot slowly gained sentience, all while having no knowledge of their origins and original purpose. As life on Bera Magna began to regress into nomads wandering the desert and the robot launched forth into the universe, we have now reached the end of the beginning and the start of a new chapter in Bionicle lore. It's at this point in the story that we actually begin to cover some of the story concepts outlined in the actual set years of the LEGO theme. Everything we just learned today has just been preamble for the major events of the Bionicle storyline and there is so much more to cover. I hope that you enjoyed this video and stay tuned for next time where we post Chapter 1, The Beginnings. Until then, let me know down in the comments below if you enjoyed this retelling, and for any new fans just listening in for the first time, please let me know if there was anything confusing or any details you felt weren't perfectly spelled out. I will definitely address these in our recap before the next chapter, so please let me know down in the comments what you thought either way. I hope you enjoyed this video, let me know down in the comments below if you like this style of storytelling, what do you want to see more, and are you enjoying the story so far? Thank you so much for tuning in, and bye bye for now.